It is Monday, December 25th, and this is The National. Tonight, on a cold Christmas, frigid temperatures strand almost 100 train passengers. How the tiny town of Spy Hill, Saskatchewan came to the rescue. It is a dark Christmas in Puerto Rico. Parts of the island still have no power. We find out how people are coping. But we begin with the royal holiday tradition to see how it is changing with the times. For the royals, Christmas Mass at Sandringham is always a mix of personal devotion and public duty. This year, it's also a chance to show off how this family is growing. <laughs> Hundreds of spectators braved the cold to get a glimpse of the newest face in the family, Meghan Markle, now engaged to Prince Harry. There she is curtsying for the Queen. Markle's presence at the royals' only event is another sign she is shaking things up. Normally, outsiders are only welcome once they've married in. Even Kate Middleton had to wait until she wed Prince William before she could be invited. We'll hear from the Queen and her Christmas message in just a moment. This really is a landmark year for her. But we thought we would start our top story in Canada. Here's James Murray with the kind of Christmas this has turned out to be. Most of Canada is coming to the end of a very white Christmas. And even here in Toronto, where snow on December 25th is never a sure thing, there's white all around, the ice looks great, and Christmas cheer is easy to find. <laughs> he sure looks like him, leading about a dozen elves through downtown Toronto. Merry Christmas. All these people lit, left their house Christmas morning and uh, we're trying to make it, it a better place. Volunteers making a difference, handing out scarves and gloves. Generosity here, too, at the Scott Mission, a holiday tradition that's lasted more than 75 years. A Christmas dinner for whoever needs it. Serving people like Mo, turkey, and all the fixings. Cranberry sauce, stuffing, you know, mashed potatoes, the usual, you know, the, the traditional Christmas dinner. If you have nowhere else to go, Christmas can be a really lonely time. And uh, it's important that there's somewhere for them to go. Getting where anyone wanted to go was a problem for people trying to move through the northeastern United States. Boston's Logan International shut its runways for a bit, just too much snow, straining an American airport system already dealing with record levels of passengers. Without a doubt, the travel for the year-end holiday has uh, a lot to do with airfares being lower. No worries about snow in St. Peter's Square, where thousands gathered to hear the Pope's Christmas address. Francis called for a negotiated two-state solution to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. He encouraged people to see Jesus in children who suffer from war, migration and disasters. The Queen gave a royal wave before heading into Christmas Mass in Sandringham. In her annual Christmas message, she marked the spasms of tragedy and violence that shook the UK this year. We expect our homes to be a place of safety, sanctuary even which makes it all the more shocking when the comfort they provide is shattered. She noted the Grenfell Tower fire that claimed so many lives and the suicide bombing at a Manchester pop concert, popular with children. Very wicked to, to target that sort of thing. Yeah. I describe that hospital visit as a privilege because the patients I met were an example to us all, showing extraordinary bravery and resilience a different kind of bravery on display here. Sufyan Mohammed learning to skate with his older brother, Babar. Is this his first time skating? Yeah. First oh, time first time ever, yeah. Now, be honest, have you fallen? Uh, not yet. <laughs> I have slipped. There was the occasional collision and so many smiles on this Christmas night. James Marie, CBC News, Toronto. A little bit more on the Queen's Christmas message. She took a moment to highlight a remarkable anniversary. Sixty years ago today, a young woman spoke about the speed of technological change as she presented the first television broadcast of its kind. She described the moment as a landmark. Television has made it possible for many of you to see me in your homes on Christmas Day. My own family often gather round to watch television as they are at this moment. And that is how I imagine you now. Back to this country now, where 98 Christmas travelers were stranded by the cold this morning, only to find the warmest of greetings in a tiny town. 
Via train number two was on its way from Vancouver to Toronto when the extreme cold just caused mechanical failure, according to Via. And the train had to stop in Spy Hill, Saskatchewan. Population, not so many. Pretty much doubled the size of the town. We're probably around 150 to 180 people in town. That is Fire Chief Jim LaRock, who helped throw together an impromptu Christmas party. Ryan Siemens, traveling from Langham, Saskatchewan, with his wife and three kids, was surely grateful for the burst of hospitality. We got here, tables were set up, and uh, food was already being made, and then they fed us, and then they brought out toys for the kids. Yeah, it was remarkable. And then some community folks together with the chefs from Via went hardcore preparing a buffet lunch for about, I think about 12.30. And so we had a pretty good Christmas brunch. Chief LaRock says the people of Spy Hill simply did the right thing. I just hope that, you know, if my family were ever stranded, that somebody would do the same for us. It, there isn't a question, you just do. After lunch, the passengers were loaded onto buses bound for Winnipeg. Via is trying to figure out how to get some of them the rest of the way. And another little surprise awaits those Via passengers in Winnipeg because that city woke up to its coldest Christmas morning in two decades. The temperature dropped to more than minus 30 overnight, not including the wicked wind chill. That's about 11 degrees colder than the average high for December 25th. In Nova Scotia, 55,000 customers were without electricity for most of the day. A storm brought winds gusting up to 100 kilometers an hour. Nova Scotia Power has activated its emergency operations center. And it is a dreary and potentially dangerous Christmas for the Wawakapawan First Nation in Northern Ontario. That's because two generators are down and it is struggling to maintain heat and stop the entire water system from freezing. The tiny community is only accessible by air and a winter road. Now, all of this pales in comparison to the situation in Puerto Rico. More than three months after Hurricane Maria slashed through the island, many communities are continuing to struggle, but that hasn't stopped them from trying to have a little festive fun. Jacqueline Hansen explains. Merry Christmas! For a moment, wide eyes and smiles. A sparkle in the darkness of a community still reeling from the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. A kid yesterday asked me to bring back his house the way it was before Maria. The devastating storm turned roads into rivers, destroyed buildings and knocked out all power. A shortage of supplies is reportedly delaying work to restore it. About 70% of the grid's capacity is back, but some estimate almost half the homes on the island are still in the dark. It's the longest blackout in U.S. history. Some reports say most of the island will have power restored by the end of February, but more remote areas will have to wait until May. Of the businesses that were forced to close, about 10,000 may never reopen, and more than 200,000 people who fled may not return. For those remaining, holiday decorations do little to distract from the day-to-day -day reality. This family uses a generator when they can afford it. Any Christmas lights will have to rely on batteries. The spirit of Puerto Rico this Christmas is low, this woman says. This Christmas is sad. But in the darkness, young students attempt to spark some light. Their music instructor says they are trying to lift the spirits of the community. This part over here was hit pretty bad also in Maria. And while Santa can't grant wishes to fix all that is broken here, a visit from him and a chance to tear open a present or two is also an opportunity to believe that there may still be some good to come. Oh, oh, oh. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Washington. Some diplomatic tit-for-tat from Global Affairs Canada today. It is booting out a Venezuelan diplomat and barring that country's ambassador from returning. These are retaliatory acts because over the weekend, Venezuela said it was expelling a Canadian envoy for criticizing its rights records under President Nicolas Maduro. In a statement, Foreign Affairs Minister Christian Freeland said that expulsion was typical of the Maduro regime, 
which has consistently undermined all efforts to restore democracy and to help the Venezuelan people. Now, Christmas is a time for many old traditions, obviously, but in the Holy Land, the town of Jish in the Galilee has one dating back thousands of years. The people there reviving Aramaic, the language spoken by Jesus. Derek Stoffel went to check it out. It may seem like an ordinary Christmas celebration. It's not. What draws Christians to this church in the northern Israeli town of Jish is the community's connection to Jesus Christ. Listen closely and you'll hear some of the prayers in an ancient tongue. It's Aramaic, the language Jesus spoke. When I pray in Aramaic, I am, I am feel that I am so uh, uh, near Jesus. Naveen Elias sings in the choir at St. Maroon, a Maronite Christian church. At home, she teaches her children Aramaic through song. I am very happy to song and to pray in Aramaic. Jish is one of the very few places in Israel or the Palestinian territories where you'll hear Aramaic. The town is in the Galilee, where the Bible says Jesus Christ grew up. Shadi Kalul is the man behind the Aramaic revival here. He spoke a few words of the language growing up, but he was inspired years later when he was studying at university in Las Vegas in a Bible literature class. The instructor told students that Jesus spoke Aramaic, a language that the professor said had disappeared. So I like was, off I felt offended. I immediately raised my hand. I said, excuse me, instructor, the language still exists. We still speak it. We still pray in it. <laughs> Kalul returned home to Jish and in the decades since has worked tirelessly to promote the language. It's written about Gavre Ibnai Israel. He found old texts, including this Bible, in Aramaic. He's talking about Jesus, this text. At the local school, about 120 students now study the language. There's also an Aramaic Sunday school and concerts at the church, all an effort to have the ancient language thrive. And my language and my identity and my culture is my future. This is the importance of Aramaic. We are building a hope for people. Now Kalul wants to establish a new town for Aramaic speakers, a place to showcase the community's connection to Jesus. Derek Stoffel, CBC News, Jish in northern Israel. For a language that is rarely heard, millions got a big dose of Aramaic on the big screen. That's been <laughs> Director Mel Gibson used the ancient dialect extensively in his 2004 film, The Passion of the Christ. I flit, I float, I flee, 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 I fly. The actor who played Louisa von Trapp in The Sound of Music has died from brain cancer. Heather Menzies was born in Toronto and grew up in California, and she found fame at 15 in this signature role. I mean, it was just hysterical, nothing but laughs, and we forgot that we were making a movie half the time. You know, we were just uh, kids having a good time. So it was probably with the friendships and Doremi. So, a needle pulling thread, la, a note to follow so, tea, a drink with jam and bread. Menzies also starred in the TV spin-off of Logan's Run. Well, from all that we've seen, everything's so beautiful here. She was married to TV star Robert Urich until his death. She made some guest spots on some of his series. And Heather Menzies was 68 when she died last night, Christmas Eve, in Frankfurt, Ontario. Well, from the sound of music to street art, Richard Hamilton was considered a godfather of the genre, an artist whose influence is still being felt today. The Canadian died in October in New York, the city he called home for nearly 40 years. Stephen D'Souza looks back at the life and the legacy of Hamilton, who came to be known as the Shadow Man. In the uh, summer of 1980, it was impossible to miss Richard's shadows. Lurking under the cover of night, Richard Hamilton's art wasn't meant to be simply stared at. It was meant to be experienced. First time you saw one, you, you know, practically jumped out of your skin because you, you thought somebody was lurking in the, in the alleyway and was about to you know, grab you and take your money. 
Before the British street artist Banksy, there was Hamilton. It was New York City in the early 1980s. The Vancouver native was dodging police on the Lower East Side to create the shadowy figures that would earn him the title, the godfather of street art. I mean, they really show that the work is part of the city. Yeah. Warren Jacobi got to know Hamilton filming the documentary Shadow Man, chronicling what would end up being the artist's final years. I really think Richard is the original gangster of street art. In the mid-1970s, he shocked Vancouver with anonymously painted bodies spattered with red paint. A conceptual artist, he created a fake identity and detective agency to solve the non-existent crimes that had people in media at the time scratching their heads. And uh, we have his aliases here, Rick Tracy. His art, though not his name, was well known by the time he arrived in New York in 1979. Richard had it. When you were in his sphere, he was just a compelling personality. He was, he was brilliant, he was a genius. My paintings may look fast and spontaneous, but there's a lot of planning and premeditation that goes into it. He painted 450 shadowy figures across New York and became a fixture on the Lower East Side art scene. Hamilton toured Europe and even painted his figures on the Berlin Wall. Andy Warhol repeatedly asked Hamilton to paint his portrait but the mercurial artist never complied. Quirky doesn't do it justice. He could be charming, he could be charismatic, he could also be unbelievably manipulative. For all his notoriety, Hamilton never craved fame, even worked to avoid it. In the late 1980s, he retreated from the spotlight, battling drug addiction and paranoia. All he wanted was to do his art with no constrictions. He lived outside of the box and, you know, kind of like a nomad. He moved constantly, often trading art for food and rent. He was frequently evicted. Angry landlords trashed countless pieces when they kicked him out. Gallery owners Christine and John Woodward tried to take care of Richard those years, putting him up in various places and paying his legal fees after evictions. He always wanted his art to be more important than himself. It was always that way. It was never about him. It was about his art. In 2007, the Woodwards hosted his first solo show in 22 years. Then, in 2009, another show, this one sponsored by Giorgio Armani. In his last years, cancer had eaten away at his face. His heroin addiction continued, and he was suffering from scoliosis. Through it all, though, he kept creating. There was something that he was working out. There were demons or ideas or things that was being expressed through the work that he was doing right up till the day he died. Hamilton died at the end of October days before one of his works was set to show at the Museum of Modern Art. We all wish that he could have been here. And, and a few weeks before the documentary about his life was released in theatres. He never really did the, the, the horse and rider series on the street. As so often happens when artists pass away, John Woodward says he's seeing renewed interest in Hamilton's work. One piece he says captures the essence of the artist is this. Long before Photoshop, Hamilton took an image of Vancouver's Angel of Victory statue and transformed it. I had worked with Richard on this a long time ago, and he said, don't show this to anybody until I leave Earth. Hamilton created this piece in 1974, while still in his 20s. You can even see the early signs of the shadows that would later define him. That's the genius behind his work, is that Richard always thought ahead. He was one step ahead of everybody. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News. New York. Still ahead on The National, we go behind the scenes at the annual ritual that is the Nutcracker. That is coming up. But next, Red Sharon offers a profile in courage. Despite undergoing cancer treatment, one woman is determined to make a positive difference in the world. They came in their thousands to this shrine of aviation to witness history replayed and in some cases bag it to take with them. This is hallowed ground and uh, I consider it sacred. I'm an aviation enthusiast. No shortage of those on this rain drenched day. Among them movie star John Travolta and President Bush. And on the day they did fly, just like today, the conditions were not ideal. But they went ahead anyway. There is a Canadian built jet trainer. Used Overhead, a Canadian contribution, a fly passed by two snowbirds, here to mark the centennial of the Wright brothers' first flight. 
but it really uh, hit home that that hey we uh, we flew a hundred years to the day over the exact same site it's uh, it still hasn't totally sunk in I don't think I often wonder if Uncle Orr fully understood the gift the view he and Uncle Will would give the world from these beautiful sandy dunes on December 17th in 1903 on that date two brothers from Dayton Ohio achieved what no one else had controlled heavier than air flight today it seems like such a modest achievement Beginning from the point of that granite marker, the Wrights spent just 12 seconds in the air, a mere 120 feet to land here. And yet, even that short hop truly was, to coin a later phrase, a giant leap for mankind. Countdown to Kitty Hawk. A leap this, this team of aviators hoped to replicate the with their wood, cloth, and wire reproduction of the Wrights flying machine. There she goes! After a two-hour wait, the rains finally subsided, and the replica flyer trundled down its runway, tantalizingly close to taking off before splashing into a mud puddle. Disappointing the pilot, but not the crowd. I have survivor right here. When I'm having a bad day, I just look down and, I, and remind myself that I'm a survivor and it doesn't, doesn't get to define who I am. On this day of gift giving, we have a story about a woman who personifies some precious ones, those of courage, resilience, and the unwavering belief that she can make a positive difference in the world. We first met Carling Muir about a year ago. At the age of 29, she had already been battling brain cancer for a decade. And over this last year, she has given Red Sharon extraordinary access as she undergoes treatment. Tonight, he brings us an update of Carling's journey. As far as I remember, like it was a normal practice. I had no issues. Life can change in an instant. It was that weekend before that I had had really bad migraines, but I didn't think much of it. It did for Carling Muir. I remember doing like our one, two, three Langara, and then I don't remember anything after that. I rolled back and I had the seizure. My teammate, after I was done, sat in front of my feet and I sat up and I looked her in the eyes, but she said she could tell I just, I wasn't there. Carling's mom, Shelly. We were driving in and she was still in the ambulance. And they had to pull over because she had a seizure on the way to the hospital. And uh, I could hear her yelling in the background. Terrifying. Terrifying. Yeah. He came in and said that they had found um, a, a significant sized tumor in the left lobe of my brain and that we would have to go in for emergency surgery. You remember that? I remember that because I remember the first question I asked was, Am I going to die? And I, I vividly remember asking that question. Her father, Grant, is a retired Vancouver firefighter. I've seen a lot of gruesome things in my life. You know. I almost, I almost threw up when, when they showed me the picture and I saw this. And it's just like a black and white picture. It's not gory, but just... Yeah, it hit you. It was, it was like nothing ever. It was... Everything changed. Yeah. I'm sorry. That was 10 years ago. She's been fighting ever since. I did the chemo for a year, but I was able to go back and play um, that following September while I was going through chemo. Uh, and then it was, um, I was good for about five years and I got re-diagnosed and I did six weeks of radiation. Uh, again, decided to play through it. Um, playing was just huge for me because it gave me a place where I could go and not think about having cancer. But she's not done fighting, far from it. So what time's your MRI car? A final brain scan before surgery. A new approach that could save her life. The 
job with the trajectory is aim the laser down the barrel of it, as I mentioned, right, in the middle. right down the middle. Yeah. Neurosurgeon Dr. Brian Toyota will perform this unique procedure. The probe is inserted through a small incision made in the skull. Carly's going to be asleep just for 20 minutes for this part, although it's really at her discretion. I can do this under local anesthetic. Then she gets a laser treatment during which she's awake. Guided very precisely using a real-time MRI, the laser kills the cancer from the inside out. So it increases the chance of success. It definitely does. And you're right, it's not the magic bullet for everybody, uh, but for the right person with the right combination, it will make a huge difference. And so we have to push that frontier, and this is what this is doing. Right. Well, let's hope that's what it does for Carla. You bet. On Wednesday, Carling, an outreach worker at the Surrey School District, says see you later to her class. On Saturday, it's lunch with the girls. On Sunday, she packs. Because I've never done it before. And takes a few minutes to watch a recording of the Gord Downey interview. His struggles are her struggles. Radiation, mm -hmm. chemo, mm -hmm. constant MRIs. Mm -hmm. Sounds a little bit like it you. Just does sound a bit. like me, yeah. <laughs> Road and overdrive. <laughs> Two hours from surgery. With the joking around, it's hard to believe what is about to happen. Mom and Dad are here, brother Parker, and her partner Andrew. Hey, Carling. Hey, how are you? I'm great. You all set? Yep. We're all set. We're on time. Beautiful. So this is just a really quick part where we make that portal of entry trajectory, wake up right away, and then we'll be hanging out upstairs in the inner ICU for a couple of hours before we actually do the lasering later today. In moments, they will roll her down to OR. The first part of her surgery will set the guide for the laser probe that will enter the tumor and heat and destroy it. In traditional brain surgery, they would attempt to remove the tumor a highly invasive procedure requiring a much larger opening in her skull, hours in the operating room, and weeks of recovery. On the pointer, it corresponds to the crosshairs on the head. This will be much less invasive. We're just validating the accuracy. Once they pinpoint the placement of the probe, guided by detailed MRI scans of Carling's brain, only a small incision is used to reveal the skull and a hole barely the circumference of a pencil is drilled. Okay. You're just gonna leave the two screws in? Don't want the third one? Yeah. Screws will hold the probe guide solidly in place. The depth of the tumor is seven. Can I see that? A temporary okay. cover is devised for the probe's guide. And then we'll put it on. And in less than 45 minutes, it's over. They're already waking Carling up. All done, Carling. This part went super. Four hours pass. And we catch up with Carling down near the magnetic resonance imaging device. How's that feel? It's all right. <laughs> okay, okay, we need to get you real comfortable because we're going to have you lie still for a good 30 minutes. Through the window, we can see the light of the laser as they place it inside her head and into the tumor. So it's in there now? It's in there now, yeah. yeah. Carling is asking me how come she didn't feel it, but the brain doesn't have feeling. Not literally, anyway. But just as they are about to begin, there's a problem. It may be a bad probe. Something isn't working the way it's supposed to. Okay. Protocol settings aren't matching up with the probe type. Go through some steps here again, see if we can fix that. We're going she's down. <laughs> We're gonna fail. With a process this new and with an uncomfortable patient, rather than push through and try to find the problem, Dr. Toyota decides to wait one more day. You've had a few setbacks over the 10 years, and this is a small one, okay, Carly? So you're a good sport. We'll get this done. Okay. 
she said, now that's it, I'm done, so we stop. Okay. And so they're saying, it's no one's fault, uh, we'll redraw, uh, no one got hurt, we'll get this done, we'll just get it done a little bit later. They will work through the night to solve the problem. By the next day, mom and dad look tired. Must have been a long night. <laughs> very long. Yeah. 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 Very long, very tired, disappointing. But we're going again, so. Yeah, hope for the best. Yep, exactly. How are you feeling? Uh, I feel pretty good. Yeah, this will be the one. Yeah, I, I fully believe in that. All right, get yeah. some rest. All right, thank you. Okay. That feels pretty comfortable. Mm -hmm. Doing great. Good. See ya. This time, it's all systems go. How long should it take once you start with the laser? The actual laser, I suspect, will take about uh, 20 minutes That's of actual cool. lasering. Yeah. Wow. It varies from uh, tumor to tumor, but just estimating carlings, uh, the way it's looking, I think 20 minutes. So we're about to start the laser now, so I step on the pedal, which will turn the laser on. As the yellow line expands, the laser is doing its work, killing the cancer. This entire area has been eradicated of tumor. So we're gonna go a little bit deeper. It is close to her speech area, so we're mindful of that, of course. I'll just go let her know we're done and then we'll shoot. Within moments, it's all over. And Carling, fully conscious, is being wheeled back out. Then something almost unbelievable happens. So can yeah. I touch that? Yeah. yeah, let me just take this off. Moments after having a laser removed from her brain, Carling gets up off the table and walks to the washroom. I can't believe you just walked out of there and went to the washroom. Anyway, we'll leave you alone. I want to pee so bad. <laughs> and with that, it's off to rest for the night. So this battle is over, but is it too soon to claim total victory? Reg is there when Carling finds out if the chemo has worked. You ready for it? I'm ready for it. I, I can't not be ready for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is what it is. It is exactly. Yeah. Damien Carson of Canmore is 24 years old. At that age, most young adults are starting new careers and looking toward the future. But Carson's athletic career is just about over, and there's a big hole in his resume, a trip to the Winter Olympics. I quit right after I'd had the best results of my career, and I couldn't afford to continue skiing, so. Carson retired from the sport of Nordic combined 10 months ago, but he couldn't stay away. Carson's taking one last shot at his Olympic dream and several shots at a system that has rarely supported him. It's been incredibly frustrating. You know, you, you go over to Europe and you're competing and you're beating skiers and you see them go home and, you know, they have a job in the army where all they do is train and get a paycheck. So, you know, that, that's very frustrating. But, you know, it's part of being Canadian. What can you do? Just keep plugging away. Carson says his living expenses are well over $1,000 a month. Most Canadian athletes competing internationally get $1,100 a month from the federal government. But athletes like Carson and others get nothing from the government because of inconsistent results. It's an Olympic sport, but we haven't had anybody in the Olympics for so long. And I mean, again, a catch-22, you need the money to get someone to the Olympics, but you don't have anybody at the Olympics to get the money. Chris Holland of Calgary has done remarkably well despite the lack of financial support. He finished third last weekend in a World Cup B event at Canada Olympic Park. Holland is the only Canadian competing regularly on the A circuit, but he's running out of chances to qualify for the 2002 Winter Olympics in Salt Lake. I think it's difficult mostly because the pool of athletes we have is so much smaller than if you look at Norway or Finland or Germany. I mean, they have just such a large base of athletes they can pull out an athlete that's been training his whole life that's better than anybody here. That's a common excuse for Canadian athletes competing in low-profile sports. But why is it that some other facilities left over from the Calgary Winter Games are producing good results? The Olympic Oval is the home of several world champions, including Katrina LeMay-Done, an Olympic gold medalist in speed skating. 
Very few Canadians have ever been in a bobsleigh, but Pierre Luders of Edmonton has also won a gold medal at the Olympics. Some experts say that it's easier to recruit and keep athletes in bobsleigh and speed skating. The Calgary Olympic Development Association gives money to every one of those sports. COTA hands out more than $7 million a year in facilities and program grants. COTA has just announced its next legacy program. It's an ambitious plan to expand Canada Olympic Park and invest more money in sports like ski jumping and Nordic combined. If you used a simple cost effectiveness rule, we'd all be playing soccer. You know, I mean, we, we wouldn't be involved in a lot of these sports, but the fact is that Canadians express themselves in different ways. And there are youngsters up there in the ski jump that, that have to fly. Here we have a ski jumping complex and a training environment uh, next to a city or in a city of almost a million people. Uh, we think the raw material here is outstanding and we think there are uh, kids out there that, that, that want to jump. Andy Osadets is one of those youngsters that loves to fly. He won't be 14 until April, but he's already been ski jumping for five years. Like we're rising up and the younger guys here are really going to be the future of ski jumping. Osadets is a member of Team 2010, a group of young athletes that has already had some success internationally. They have a European coach and an aggressive attitude. With ski jumping it's more that you need to have the, the mindset to it and then you can, you can just train yourself physically over the years. It takes between six and eight years to develop an Olympian in ski jumping or Nordic combined. So John Mills is preaching patience. We hope that Canada will be at the top of the Olympic uh, rung in 2010. It's been almost six months. We've kept in touch, but today... Hello! Hi, how are you? It's good, face you? to face. Good Sorry, to see you. I, I brought you a treat. Yeah, they're lemon blueberry scones. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Am I allowed to give you a hug? Yeah, absolutely. Good. You look fabulous. Thanks. <laughs> fabulous for a young woman who's been through what she has. She's been on chemotherapy ever since, trying to kill the cancer they couldn't reach. Just like any other medication, like my tumor has gotten smarter. Now it's just, it's not reacting at all. It's actually continuing to grow when I was on it, so that's why they wanted to switch. Then, in the middle of it all, a really bad scare. Driving home after a girl's weekend, she felt a seizure coming on again. It was about 9.30, so it was dark, and I was in the middle lane. So I hit my brakes and I remember cars coming past and honking, but I couldn't see them because I was, my head was like looking up at the roof. So you managed to get off the road? I think someone drove my car off the road. I'm so lucky that I, I wasn't hit. <laughs> yeah, you must have thought about that. If you I was, like, when I was having my seizure, I had enough, I don't know, memory to think like, oh my God, I'm gonna get hit, I'm gonna get hit. It was terrifying. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't think of a more scary thing to happen, mm -hmm. yeah. Tomorrow's a big day. It is a big day. You ready for it? I'm ready for it. I, I can't not be ready for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is what it is. It, it's exactly, yeah. Yeah. It's hard to imagine they're waiting to hear the news that will affect all their lives. Carling's parents and partner Andrew are here to offer support. We joke around a lot in here and so we always wonder like if it's like making like other rooms feel uncomfortable. <laughs> Neuro-oncologist Dr. Brian Thiessen has been assessing Carling's scan. Hi guys. Hello. He will deliver the findings. So we have some things to chat about today. Oh no. There are some issues with your scan we have to deal with. Okay. It's not good news. So this is your picture from the last scan, right? This is now? And this is now. It's bigger. It's causing a bit more pressure. It's starting to get into that 
corpus callosum there what, too. What is so, that part? so that's the corpus callosum, which is the connector fibers between the two sides of your brains. Mm -hmm. So it's starting to creep over that way. Carling and Andrew head off to talk. Mom and Dad are understandably in shock. Scared. Yeah. It's getting scary. She's a pretty good friend, I know, for us. But, uh, still strong, you're right. Oh my goodness, we're scared. Can you imagine what she's feeling right now? Yeah. During the summer, Andrew and Carling kept their routine as normal as possible. In the meantime, Vancouver General decided to suspend further neuroblate probe procedures, saying it wanted more proof there were greater benefits than more conventional treatment. After a long struggle, the tragically hips Gore Downey dies of a rare form of brain cancer. In October, the loss of fellow brain cancer patient Gord Downey, lead singer of the band Tragically Hip, hits hard. Yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing what he did. Um, and pretty sad. That, and pretty sad. You see how quickly it can go. Yeah. He was on TV a couple months ago, and then everything happened, so. Yeah. And that hits pretty close to home. Definitely. Yeah. For Halloween, Carling's parents, Grant and Shelley, throw a big party with Andrew and Carling as special guests. For Carling... Knowing what they've been going through is the hardest part. I worry more like what it does to like my family. That's the part that gets me. What it does to Andrew and my parents and my brother and my fa like all my other family and friends. It's okay. I'm, I can deal with it myself, but I hate putting them through that. And that's, that's what keeps me up at night. Which brings us to a year since we first started following Carling's journey. Since she first led us into her life. Looks nice. She and Andrew have now moved to Langley. Hi. Hello. How are you? How are you? Good. I brought you a little housewarming present. Oh, thank you. The latest round of chemo has been particularly tough. Well, at first it felt like my feet and my hands were going numb, which is common with this type of chemo, and pins and prickles and like that kind of stuff. But then I started feeling like prickles all over my body, like I had something stuck in it, but it wasn't there. Um, and then the burning in the skin started. And that's when it just like gradually got stronger and stronger to the point where like I couldn't sleep. Like it, it made me yell out in the middle of the night. Like it, it was pretty excruciating. I don't know how you do it. I mean, you know, this is 10 years of this and, and more now. It's getting I'm really tougher. starting, yeah, to feel like I'm just like I'm poisoning my body. So it's essentially... On the upside, this latest scan shows she is at least holding her own. They didn't find any changes in it. They could still consider it stable. So basically it's still the same as this? Pretty much, yeah. Ideally, we would like to see it shrink, shrink. but stability is good as well. We just don't want to continue with growth. Hey, buddy. Huh? For now, it's one day at a time doing what she does, surviving. I have survivor right here. I know that I have cancer and I technically haven't beaten it. When I'm having a bad day, I just look down and, I, and remind myself that I'm a survivor and it doesn't, doesn't get to define who I am. Carling, I gotta tell you that you are one brave and beautiful soul. Thank you. You've, you've, been, you've, you've been a real inspiration to me. Huh? Thank you. Good luck to you. Thank you, you too. Take good care. You too. Red Sharon, CBC News in Langley, British Columbia. Still ahead on The National, the Nutcracker is an annual ritual but it takes a lot of fine-tuning. We'll take you behind the scenes. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your onstage call. Onstage, please, for the top of Act One.
One of the very wisest of men once said, of the making of books there is no end, nor of the selling of them. Prizes help. The literary prize has two functions. It's an honor, and it's a way of getting good books noticed. There are some very well-known prizes, the contentious, much-hyped Booker in England, the prestigious Pulitzer. These prizes are the Academy Awards of Literature. The Canadian prize has been making quite a stir, too. This is the seventh year of the Giller Prize for Fiction. In that short time, the Giller has established itself as Canada's number one glamour literary prize, a neat counterpoint to the more steadfast Governor General's Award. The Giller thrives on glamour. The judges are eminent, the venue high class, and the publicity driven. It is the darling of the Canadian publishing industry and is most un-Canadianly high-spirited. It's fair to say that the night of the Giller party and banquet is a gathering of the cultural stars, a little chest pounding for the literary set and the culture mavens, fancy dress, self-esteem. The Giller doesn't apologize for glitz and show, it's part of its charm. It doesn't hurt to have some high-grade winners, too. I'm pleased to announce that Alice Munro is the winner of the 1998 Giller Prize for a short collection, The Love of a Good Woman. So far, the winners have included the reigning aristocrats of Can Lit. Besides Munro, Margaret Atwood and Mordecai Richler to name a few eminences. I take it that this great painting on the wall is the person from the well, ab slave. Absolutely. This, is, this was Doris in all her glory. The Giller story is sad and happy. Doris Giller was a lively, vigorous literary journalist who passed away in 1993. Jack Rabinovich, her husband, decided to keep her name alive in a way that would honor and please her. Hence, the Giller Prize, stylish, first class, and impossible to ignore. It has a very simple focus. Select the best author, the best book, period, paragraph 30. It's just a matter of simple merit as judged by three human beings who are normally peers in the writing group. It's good to be friends with Mordecai Richler if you're starting a literary award. Richler has won a powerful number of them himself. He was on the Giller's very first judges panel, gave it credibility from the start, and was the first person Rabinovich consulted about the idea of the Giller. I warned Jack foolishly that uh, it would take five or six years before anyone paid any attention. Yeah. And of course it took off immediately, and it was a huge success to esteem. And, uh, a lot of it was due to Jack's enormous generosity and to that very stylish banquet and to the quality of the books that were chosen, I think. I mean, it's almost unique in Canada for a businessman to do this. Yeah, it is. Without any government help or leaning on any government. When you hear the applause at the end of every performance, you know that there are a lot of people out here who maybe it's their first time in this terrific theater, maybe it's their first time seeing a ballet, and that applause is fantastic. It is, of course, a holiday classic, the National Ballet of Canada's The Nutcracker, and this is a behemoth of a show. Performers and sets moving on and off the stage in clockwork perfection, or at least that's what it seems like to us. On this Christmas night, David Common once again takes the National inside the Nutcracker. Magnificent as it seems, midway through the first act, there's a problem. Oh, Charlie. Here, a mustache has come unglued, an urgent fix for one of the key performers seconds before he's set to return to the stage. The audience, of course, has no idea. None, in fact, of what happens backstage. But we have unprecedented access. Watching his dancers throw snowballs from off stage. As rollerblading bears stand by in the wings. The youngest performers are just six years old, now preparing for their first ever grand event. 
This is make or break for the National Ballet, the annual ritual that helps pay for the rest of the year. It attracts huge audiences every December, including this one. The first full dress rehearsal with what will be a full house. As that audience begins to take their seats backstage, the show is in its final preparations. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your onstage call. Onstage, please, for the top of Act One. For the man who's helped it run for decades, the stakes are still high. As soon as the orchestra starts tuning, we're sort of on a we're on an unforgiving path. It's at that point that I can't change my mind and leave. That's <laughs> yeah, the point of no return. It kind of is, yeah. A month before showtime, the enormous effort begins with massive sets moved out of storage. Nine trailers full. This is yours. Oh, great. There. How is that when you put your arms up? Oh, we should try your tiara too. Okay. Charlie? Yeah. Meanwhile, sugar plum fairies get fitted for costumes, and rehearsals begin. The National Ballet's own may be experienced at the Nutcracker, but with need for such a large cast, most of the performers come from outside the company, many of them just kids. They'll rehearse together with the orchestra fewer than a handful of times before facing a paying audience a grueling 26 times. And showtime is just moments away. It may not get the glory, but the two dancers stuffed inside this horse certainly have one of the most challenging parts. One of them can't see, so both are led gingerly onto the stage. When the horse's part is complete, the heavy costume is hung, and the dancers slip out, rushing to their next role. <laughs> Watch out, a big move is about to happen. It takes 10 people to move out this Christmas tree set. On stage, the decorated branches swing a movement rode from behind by a stagehand. But all that swinging is a hazard one dancers try to avoid. The people that tend to get whacked by the branches tend to be some of the performers in the battle. And there's, there's square steel underneath the, the sort of fur dressing, so they can, they can give you a, a good bark in the shins. The performers may be in peak physical shape, but the Nutcracker is an exhausting performance. Poised and precise ballerinas on stage step off briefly to recover and rehydrate. As the end of the snow scene nears, stage director Jeff Morris is still calling the shots. It's magic, absolutely. It's so satisfying. And when you hear the applause at the end of every performance, you know that there are a lot of people out here who maybe it's their first time in this terrific theater, maybe it's their first time seeing a ballet, and that applause is fantastic. Applause for an act that seems serene and precise, belying the organized chaos just behind the performance. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back behind the lens, what it can mean when our cameras capture powerful images in Canada's north. I'm okay now, I see all the reindeer climbing up. <laughs> Right now, I'd like to bring out another fellow who's been on Music Hall before, and I know you're going to like him because he does such a terrific job on everything he sings. He's got a new folk song number for us, one that is really starting to make it on the hit parade charts. Let's have a real good welcome from Gord Lightfoot as he sings Jimmy Rogers' new up-and-comer, 210-618. <laughs> My sisters 
songs are booming these days. Uh, it's very good, Al. It's, uh, there certainly is a lot of work around for folk singers, and uh, it's becoming quite evident. A lot of our uh, more commercial type folk songs are becoming uh, quite evident. Mm -hmm. You'll never take me alive, okay? Ring in the new year. Didn't see that one coming. With the oh. annual Air Force One Hour Special. Very funny. Stop calling me. <laughs> new Year's Eve at 8 on CBC. <laughs> Over the holidays, the people behind the CBC News cameras have been sharing some of their most powerful images of the year. Randall McKenzie is a longtime videographer in Yellowknife. He knows the Northwest Territories, communities, and its landscape. And he also knew a particularly special moment on the McKenzie River Delta when he saw it. So when I'm out there shooting and I'm looking for a good shot there, I'm, I'm not trying to force something. When I see something in my viewfinder, it just rings in your ears that you got a good shot. My favorite uh, assignments are always are going up to the Mackenzie Delta. The caribou and the reindeer herd up there are very much a part of the people and I was able to uh, capture an elderly woman that was uh, experiencing the herd since uh, the first time since she was a little girl. I thought I better get brave and go look at the reindeer maybe for the last time of my life. <laughs> it can uh, touch you right to the heart. It can make you feel for a person that you've never met. I'm okay now, I see all the reindeer climbing up. <laughs> There's a whole ecosystem and culture and communities in places that um, people think there's nothing. I'm enormously proud to, to, to be working as a videographer here. I've been doing it for a long time and uh, I don't think I'll ever stop. <laughs> what a great scene. That is The National on this Christmas night. Thank you for watching. Good night.